Hey guys, Alan, Solid Rock Bible Class. Hey, we're um, talking still down the line of character traits of Jesus. We're going to be talking about the word fair today. Fair. Seeing a situation from the viewpoint of each person that's involved. Well, let's look into the Old Testament first for a scripture that I want us to look at. It says, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to live to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. Then we jump over to the book of Matthew, and it says, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do you even so to them. For this is the law of the prophets. You know, I think sometimes when we think about, about this word fair, are we really fair with people? Well, I'm going to look at something, and maybe I shouldn't look at it this way, but I'm going to. And I'm going to ask the question, is God fair? Is God fair? I think all of us at some point in time in our life, we've asked that question, is God fair? We look at Psalmist David here in Psalms, the 19th division, verse 9. And it says, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So is this really true? You know, you think about two babies that are born. One is what we'd almost look at and say is perfect, and you look at another one and he's got all these deformities or he has all these problems, physical problems, mental problems. What about two mothers who take and they pray for their son and one prayer seems to be answered for the other one just seems like it's almost unheard. You think about a a farmer who takes and he puts his entire life into this crop and one farmer he uh, he flourishes and the other one ends up in a drought and loses everything he has what about a person that takes and dies young that's trying to live for the Lord Jesus Christ and then we see another one that it's almost a menace to society that has great health and does fine. You know, it's almost like God, you know, he almost, he lets somebody live that is a scoundrel, someone that shouldn't even be alive, it seems like. So, how about a Christian? You end up sometimes with with Christians and, and, and even a, a marriage situation where one ends up in divorce and one doesn't. I think, you know, if we put God on trial here, it'd be kind of easy sometimes to take and almost make a, make a judgment and say that he's really not fair. But, you know, let's look at the other side and let's look at being almost like a defense lawyer for God here. And let's ask ourselves, is God fair? So we look, first of all, let's look at man in his disobedience to God. We see that man was made perfect. God made male and female, and he put them in the garden in a perfect world. Man was given absolutely everything. He was given authority over everything. He was given authority to be able to think. He was given authority to, to take and determine what his life was going to be like. The right choice, the wrong choice. He, but he had this free will. It meant God, it meant that man could take and he could choose God or he could choose evil. Instead of good, good of course, we see that man chose evil. It meant that man had a choice. Maybe a bad choice, but he had a choice. Then we take, and we, we take and we read about the tragic disobedience, which was in the very beginning of all the troubles. And we see Cain and we see Abel and we see Cain kills Abel. 
doesn't really seem fair, does it? So we can take and I guess we, we could blame all of our problems on God, but in reality, all the blame actually belongs on us, doesn't it? It belongs on man. You know, you remember Philippa Wilson? This 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 will age me. It'll age some of you if you remember him. And he said, you know, the devil made me do it. Well, although the the centuries have passed since that, since Flip here said this, you know, most most men and uh, their troubles uh, they've they've come because of disobedience to God. Look at Galatians the sixth chapter with me for a second. In the seventh verse. He says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. You know, there's three things that we can look at here that involve God's will. You know, the first one would be that God has an intentional will. The second thing we can really look at here is that God, he has a circumstantial will. And the third one I guess we can look at is God has this ultimate will. Here, let's look at these just for a couple of seconds. So let's look first of all at God's intentional will. This is what God intended to happen in your life. Remember the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sure it was not his intention that Peter took and denied him three times. I'm sure that was not his intentional will. He wanted Peter to probably stand up for him. But man, again, has that free will. In the book of 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, verses 12 and 13, he says, <clears throat> Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. You know, we need to realize it's not strange when we have temptation. It's not strange when we have a bad thought. He goes on in verse 13. But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Verse number 14. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of the glory and of God resteth upon you on their part, he is evil spoken of, but in your part, he is glorified. But let none of your suffer, let none of you suffer, excuse me, as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. And then he says, verse 16, yet if any man suffer as a Christian, he's not saying, to, he, notice he said, not suffering as a, a murderer or a thief or an evildoer. He said, but if any of you do suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Let him glorify God because he's suffering as a Christian. Then we look at this. He has this circumstantial will. This means he must allow some things to happen in which he did not intend necessarily to happen here. Example that we could really look at. God did not intend for David to take and to, to have an affair with Bathsheba and have a baby that was born out of it and then that baby to die. That wasn't God's intent. Then we take and we can look at this third piece and we can be sure that, that, uh, that God's final victory here, that nothing can defeat him in his ultimate will. Example of we can kind of look at here, look at Job. God gave him twice as much as he had before. 
God blessed him. Paul said in the book of 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, verse 12, we, must, that we now see through this glass darkly. Think about that for a second. We're looking through this haze. We're looking through something that's not crystal clear. Sometimes we have trouble kind of distinguishing what it's all about. You could kind of say that a lot of things happen in this dark glass that we just sometimes don't understand. And it's okay sometimes that we don't understand. But then he says, we're going to see him face to face. We are going to understand everything, not in part, but some point in the future, we're going to understand it all. So that the, uh, the next thing I just wanted us to look at here is the fact that, that justice triumphs more than we may often really think. I think we always think about all the negative stuff and we never ever stop to think about the positive things that happen. There are rewards that happen. And we do see people that are punished for what they do that's wrong. And, you know, even though the gears of God take and they grind very slowly, they do grind. And we, we can see it says, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So one trouble with us, I think, is the fact that, that we measure the justice and the fairness of God by the wrong values, by the wrong things. We take and we look at a home somebody lives in. One person lives in a lavish home. One person lives in something that's not so nice. We look at somebody that has a lot of money in the bank and somebody else that doesn't. One person that gets all these these big high honors and another person that never gets recognized. So, justice is a way of, of coming out on top. Justice has just this way of coming out on top. God made, you know, the entire world to work so that a man gets what's coming to him at some point in time. God causes righteousness to prevail. We just have to remember, it takes time sometimes for it to prevail. We just have to keep doing what's right. Not focusing on the negative, but taking and focusing on God and his will. In the book of Colossians, the third chapter, verse 25, it says, But he that doth wrong shall receive of the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. The person that's doing wrong is going to get his fair share at some point. Man, man took and... Man must be rewarded for right and good and punishment for what's wrong and bad. And uh, be assured, God is not going to forget. He knows everything. So let's look at another point here in defense of God's fairness. Let us not forget the mercy he has towards us. God's mercy towards us. Man, he did not have to save us. He didn't have to send his son to die for us. Let's look at the book of Psalms for a second in the 136th division. And, uh, you know, there's 26 verses in that particular psalm. And uh, every one of them ends with, for his mercy endureth. Think about that. In one psalm, 26 times, he talks about the mercy of God. You know, you could take and take two sheets of paper. On one of them taken, you could take and write down everything. Everything that's done which is good. On the other, everything you can remember that's wrong. 
you know, your, your deeds, your words, even your thoughts. Then take and study your own list and study it really well. And they will lead you to that, to that position that you need to realize that you need to take and pray to God for forgiveness. Father, forgive me for my sins. Kind of the story of the prodigal son, right? In Luke, the 15th chapter, verse 20, remember what the prodigal said, and he, and he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet afar off, remember that? When he was yet afar off, his father saw him, ran, and he took and he tackled him, embraced him. I think these words describe our heavenly father, don't they? Jesus said that God was like that. Remember what 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, to forgive us for all of our unrighteousness. I think finally, as we kind of look at this, the most important thing that we need to decide here is whether God is fair or not, is let's look at Jesus himself. We're talking about character traits of Jesus. He was born some 2,000 years ago, crucified at about the age of 33 years old. He was buried in a tomb. Three days later, he takes and he raises from the dead, visiting and talking to friends and relatives. And then he took and he left them and went to heaven. The record that we look at here of Jesus' life here on earth, it's only, it, it's, it's the real proof of God's love. The fact that he loved us enough to send his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You can't find this beautiful picture anywhere else, can you? It's kind of hard to understand. It's really difficult to understand that kind of love that God had for us, the kind of mercy he gave us. You know, if I was, if I was going up in front of a judge someplace and I had, maybe it was something I had done like uh, maybe driving too fast. You don't, you don't ask for justice. You want for mercy, don't you? And God took and he brought mercy to us when he took and he gave his son on the cross and took and allowed us to have that position of being the sons of God. You know, sometimes I've said, I've got a thousand questions to ask God. But I have a feeling that once I meet him, I don't, won't have a whole lot of questions. I think we need to remember God, he's always good. He's not just good sometimes. God is good all the times. He always does what's right. Romans the eighth chapter, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them, what? That love God. It's not good for everyone, but it is good for those that love God and those that do God's will. So is God fair? Yes, he is. You know, where, you know, where was God when all this was, was happening? Or where is he right now? He's right where he's always been, in heaven. Jesus is by his side. And we need to remember that he took and he paid the price for our sins. He was more than fair. He went more than halfway towards us. He went all the way towards us. And as Christians, we need to remember the fact that when we think of fair, 
we need to extend that to other people that are around us. Not just to friends, but to everybody possible. Because that's a character trait of Jesus that will draw men towards God. Thanks for being with me, and we will catch up with you in church.